Let's pray, will we? Uh, most awesome and creative God, we thank you for being with us today. We thank you for sending Jesus Christ down upon this earth to walk with us and to teach us and to always point the way to you. May we follow in his footsteps and may everything that we say and think and do give you the glory. And together we say, amen and amen. So today is Pentecost Sunday. Some of you might not know what that means, so we're just going to kind of do a little recap, if you will, of what Pentecost means before we get to the scripture and then the message, okay? So from a historical perspective, Christianity didn't start with Jesus' birth or his time on earth uh, as he gained followers, nor did Christianity start at his death or even when he ascended into heaven. Pentecost Sunday is the day that the church was born. Pentecost Sunday takes place 50 days after Passover. And originally, it was a, a Jewish holiday that was held, as I said, 50 days after Passover. And it was one of the major Jewish feasts. And here's how it all got started. Believed to be the oldest feast in the church, the story of Pentecost dates back to the first century AD. The Feast of Pentecost coincided with the Jewish Feast of Weeks, and uh, that's found in Deuteronomy 16.10. And according to Jewish tradition, the Ten Commandments were given to Moses 50 days after the first Passover, which freed the Hebrews from their bondage in Egypt. And as the Hebrews settled into Canaan, the feast became a time to honor the Lord for blessing the fruits of their labors. At the time of Jesus, the festival focused on rabbinical law and traditions. And since this Jewish holiday took place at the same time of the Pentecost, many Jewish Christians appropriated its celebration into their Christian commemoration of the coming of the Spirit. So it kind of I don't know, I guess you could say it starts in John chapter 14, verses 16 to 18, when Jesus tells his disciples that the Holy Spirit would come after him. And it reads like this, and I'm reading from the NRSV version, verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. The book of Acts provides us with a starting details and events that took place to bring the church into being. Picking up the story right after the book of Luke, 40 days after Jesus' death and resurrection, and then 10 days after Jesus ascended into heaven, the promise of the Holy Spirit came to be. With 120 disciples who had been in a 10-day prayer meeting. We can find that in the second chapter of the book of Acts. And on the day of Pentecost was being fulfilled, all the disciples were gathered in one place. And suddenly they heard a, a sound of a violent blast of wind rushing into the house from out of the heavenly realm. And the roar of the wind was so overpowering. It was all anyone could bear. Then, all at once, a pillar of fire appeared before their eyes. It separated into tongues of fire that engulfed each of them. And they were all filled and equipped with the Holy Spirit and were inspired to speak in tongues, empowered by the Spirit to speak in languages they had never learned. Now these events that took place in Acts chapter 2 are what started the church and crowds came to investigate what was going on and Peter spoke to them about Jesus later on in chapter 2 and uh, verse 38 and he says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, 
and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. From the crowds, 3,000 realized the truth of Peter's words and became followers of Jesus. And the outpouring of the Holy Spirit came and resulted in tongues and prophecy and miracles and salvations and the birthing of countless churches. Okay, so that's the backstory. If you have your Bibles with you, and I hope that you do, would you please turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 to 17. Now I'm going to give you a minute. Acts is one of my favorite books. I just love the book of Acts. And it's after Luke. So it's the fifth book in the New Testament. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, Matthew, Mark. <laughs> you would think I should know this, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All right, and then the book of Acts. And Acts is kind of like the second book, if you will, the, the sequel to the book of Luke. So we're in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 17. And I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. <coughs> I'm so sorry, excuse me. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. This is the word of God for the people of God. It gives me goosebumps truly to just read this particular um, selection of scripture today. When you make the effort to speak someone else's language, even if it's just basic phrases here and there. You're saying to them, I see you as a human being. I know when I was in the military, you know, we would go all over the place and, you know, I, I, I don't know everybody's language, but guaranteed what we learned in no matter what country we were is hello, goodbye, and how to order a beer and thank you. We appreciated them, right? Um, we, we, were, we were trying. And I remember one day when I was in Germany, I had a, a conversation with a woman um, outside um, in this particular part of Germany that they were staying in, or that we were staying in. Um, every night they would go outside, the store owners, and, and they would go outside and tidy up. I mean, they would sweep the sidewalks and kind of just visit with each other. And so I was visiting with this woman, neither one of us speaking each other's language. And I'm not sure how we did it, but we were able to have a conversation about her youngest son and about my uh, stepbrother that was about the same age. And it was one of the best conversations in my life. It was amazing. We saw each other as human beings. And those words 
uh, I, I, I see you as a human being. Those words are from the memoir, Born a Crime, Stories from a South African Childhood by comedian Trevor Noah. Now, there are 11 official languages in the nation of South Africa. And Trevor talked a lot in his book about the challenges and gifts of language in his childhood, growing up as a biracial boy in the days of apartheid. And at home, the Noah family spoke, and I'm not even sure how to say that. I actually went online, uh, exhosa, but you're supposed to say it like with a click of your tongue. And, and I, I can't do it, but it, it, it's a native South African tongue. And when it came time to pray, though, they always prayed in English. And Trevor's grandmother asked him to pray because his English was the best, and the Bible is in English, she told him, so English prayers get answered first. Wow. I can imagine how his grandmother came to that conclusion, even if no one ever explicitly said it. She first heard the Bible in English. She saw white English-speaking people in their comfortable lives without the curfew or travel restrictions that she and other black South Africans faced. And she prayed, certainly, but God must have been busy answering English prayers first. Of course, we know that the Bible wasn't written in English, and we know that intellectually, but I can't help but worry about whether we, whether I, have carried on the hurtful assumptions that were taught to Trevor Noah's grandmother. Are we still making the same mistake as James and John, imagining English speakers at the right and at the left hand of Jesus? Have we been saying, God bless America for so long, that we've forgotten that God blesses other nations too? Deep down, do we think our prayers are answered first? I, I, I can't help but believe that God must have thought of those questions before the church even came to be. God saw our failures coming and, and saw our pride and, and limited worldview and pre-answered our questions in the form of a drama. And the apostles are gathered in a house, praying and waiting for God to make the next move. A violent wind fills the house, a wind that is unmistakably God. The Spirit moves them outside the house to preach of God's power, and crowds gather, Jews from every nation. I imagine it like a scene from Trevor Noah's book, a street full of people speaking 11 languages. When the apostles start speaking, everyone hears the, the words all at the same time, all in their own native tongue. And on that first Pentecost day, the Spirit could have come with any miracle under the sun. The apostles could have been miraculously healed of their ailments or lifted off the ground or given a power that any superhero would envy. But instead, the Spirit gives them the gift of communication across languages. If those first apostles found themselves tempted to think that God answered their prayers first. The Spirit burst on the scene and blew their assumptions just totally out of the water. God will pour out the Spirit, the Scripture says, on men and women, young and old, slave and free, that all will prophesy and all will be saved. That's the thing about the Holy Spirit. She doesn't have patience for the structures of our world. She doesn't care who holds the cards, who has allies in, in powerful places, who signs the paychecks, or who lives paycheck to paycheck. The Spirit is a leveling power. 
and the wind blows where she chooses. When you make the effort to speak someone else's language, Trevor Noah wrote, you are saying to them, I see you as a human being. The miracle of the Spirit on the first Pentecost was to let us hear and therefore see each other. The miracle of Pentecost was to bless our diversity and, our, and, and, and solidify our unity as one global church born of the Holy Spirit, the first Pentecost day. This is the good news of the Pentecost story. The Spirit understands all of our prayers, and the miracle is when we understand each other. In case anyone ever comes back to listen to this sermon down the road, in case this recording winds up in a, in a digital time capsule someday, let me be clear about the context in which I'm preaching. The year is 2021. It has been a year and a few months since the word COVID became a part of our daily vocabulary. With much gratitude to both God and science, and with both vaccines in my arm and two weeks after fully protected, I think I could say that we are on the tail end of a global pandemic, or at least I pray that we are. We say those words so often now, global pandemic. They just roll off the tongue. But as Christian people whose God speaks every language, we can't just breeze past the word global. You can't help but to watch the news and see what's happening in India, where they're having street burials for the people that are perishing rapidly. And over the past year and a half, COVID has touched every corner of this planet and nearly every life upon it. If we ever tried to deny how connected our world is, this pandemic has shattered any argument we might have made. We have shared a common human experience this year, one of grief and fear, and yet also of hope and gratitude. We learn once more that we have to protect each other, that my health depends on your health and your well-being on mine. We wouldn't choose to go through this pandemic again for any reason, but that doesn't mean we didn't learn something along the way. We learned just how connected we are. Now, I'm not a big fan of flying. I would much rather drive across the United States to reach any destination than fly. And having said that, I realize that Flying is the fastest way, fastest way to reach a destination. If I must fly, I like to check in early, partly so I can get through the security smoothly and partly because a lot of airports have a Cinnabon in them, right? And I, I think the, the little cups of soda they serve on the plane are just the right size. And, and you know what? Pretzels taste a whole lot better at 10,000 feet. If you've ever flown, you know there is a point when you start taxiing down the runway and then the flight attendants give a safety presentation that everyone must pay attention to. And airlines have gotten very creative with that in recent years. And some of them work in the jokes or the songs or even celebrity uh, cameos. And my favorite I saw was from Delta where they used a video at the end of the and and at the end of the safety video after they've told you to you know don or put on your your own oxygen mask before you turn and and help somebody beside you and and a pilot appears on the screen in his crisp 
blue uniform. And he says, Delta isn't flying to over 300 places just to connect us, but to show us we were never that far apart in the first place. We were never that far apart in the first place. Maybe that's what Pentecost was meant to show us. Over the last year, a tiny little virus made its way across the globe and is still leaving destruction in its path. That virus was able to touch every corner of the world because we are so incredibly connected. What if we used that incredible connection for something incredible? Imagine if we spread something besides a virus across the world in the next year. Something that would bring healing instead of heartbreak. Imagine if we committed ourselves to spreading something other than germs, to following the Holy Spirit wherever the wind may blow. Imagine if we channeled all that energy we had to put into curbing this terrible pandemic into growing something wonderful. Imagine if we listened to each other, if we had compassion for each other, if we remembered that what affects you affects me. Imagine if we spread empathy. Could it spread as quickly? I think it can. Empathy, I think, can be highly contagious. Could it travel as far? Could it travel to the four corners of the earth? Well, if a virus can get a plane ticket, I'm sure empathy can too. But what if we're immune to it? What if we're immune to empathy? What if somewhere along life, some super duper stuff happened to you and in essence gave you a vaccine to empathy? Well, I think you can regain empathy. I think it just takes a little practice. If we're not sure where to start, Perhaps we could think back once more to our Pentecost story when the Holy Spirit came down upon everybody and spoke, caused the apostles to speak in so many different languages that the crowds in the nearby cities came to hear them speak. Friends in Christ, our God speaks every language and understands every prayer. The ones that you say, the ones that are said in languages we don't understand, the ones that are said when you have no words to express, but you just feel them so deeply in your spirit. Our God speaks every language and understands every prayer. And the miracle happens when we understand each other. And I know that gets tough. I know things get said and, and, and people take them differently than, than what was meant to be. But it's working them out. How do you work them out? Do you just get all huffy and puffy and, you know, throw a fit and walk away or, or maybe even start a yelling match? We've got to come to the table of understanding. Get yourself a cup of coffee. And that's when I, when I say that, you know, if, if, you, if you get a cup of coffee and you can bounce knees, bump, bump knees under the table, you'll find something you can connect with. If coffee's not your bag, get a beer. It doesn't make any difference. Just sit at the table and understand each other. Feel the empathy and know that the Holy Spirit will be with you and that God speaks every language and understands every prayer. Let us pray. 
Come, O Spirit, as you did this first Pentecost day. Ignite your church with the fire of compassion and teach us once more to hear our neighbor's prayers. And if you agree with this prayer, say amen and amen. If you would like to help us continue to spread the good news of Jesus to the ends of the earth, would you please consider helping us financially? You may do that a couple of different ways. The first way is to download a free app, and it's called Give Lifey. One word, Give Lifey. And you can type in Redeemer Metropolitan Community Church of Flint. And once you find us, all you have to do is click on that heart button so that you won't have to do that search again. And you may use your credit card to give of an offering or a tithe or, or a donation to help us with that. Another way is you could simply write a check to Redeemer Metropolitan Community Church of Flint. And then you may mail it to 2474 South Ballinger Highway, Flint, Michigan, 48507. Every penny helps. Nobody in our church gets paid. Not me, not anybody. Everything that we get is used to help spread God's love. May God be with you. May you be blessed. And may you begin to understand each other. Peace. Love. We're signing off.